we are very lucky today to have um, Dr. Muthu Vaduganathan from, uh, who's a cardiologist and clinical trialist and a close friend of mine at Brigham and Women's Hospital and Harvard Medical School. He's co-director of the Center for Cardiometabolic Implementation Science at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And his research really spans the board, but more, more recently focuses on drug de development, clinical trials, and implementation of cardiorenal metabolic therapies, including SGLT2 inhibitors, which will be the focus of his talk today. He's authored or co-authored more than 400 peer-reviewed publications, despite being on faculty for, I think, less than five years. And, uh, and he serves on the editorial boards of multiple journals, including the European Journal of Heart Failure and JAK, and participates on the leadership teams of ongoing large-scale multinational trials in heart failure and cardiometabolic medicine. It's my honor to, to introduce Dr. Vadu uh, Please take it away. Thanks so much, Dave Raj uh, and uh, Dinder for the uh, really uh, kind invitation to, and uh, I appreciate you all joining um, in this evening hour. Um, and I hope to provide you with a uh, kind of a more practical um, uh, guide to implementation of these therapies in your own clinical practice. Um, and um, we'll start with a uh, brief kind of introduction to the overall class of therapies. Um, we'll review uh, some of the clinical trial evidence, although I want to move quickly and efficiently through that, and then end with more of the practical elements around their initiation, monitoring, um, and, and continuation in practice. So in many ways, I think that SGLT2 inhibitors have firmly become established as the modern day ACE inhibitor in terms of this, um, the spectrum of efficacy and safety. Um, and this is the overlap of these large clinical entities in US clinical practice. Um, and you can see here that many individuals, and you see this in your own clinical practice, that many individuals have overlapping cardiorenal metabolic uh, conditions. And such that individual therapies, while we often consider them as a heart failure therapy or a diabetes therapy or a CKD therapy, often may simultaneously influence different clinical pathways. And it's of no surprise then um, to think that, for instance, contemporary management of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction almost entirely overlaps with contemporary management of chronic kidney disease. So the SGLT2 inhibitors are um, all end in flozins, um, and there were four initial and currently FDA approved SGLT2 inhibitors. All were approved for glycemic control in type 2 diabetes. And these are, as you can see, not new, necessarily new or novel therapies. They were introduced in uh, 2013 in the United States. There's a fifth one uh, called sotagliflozin. That's a combination SGLT1-2 inhibitor that's currently under regulatory review by the FDA. So how do these drugs work, as, at least as glucose-lowering therapies? You see here that glucose is filtered um, into the glomerulus, and the SGLT2 and 1 um, uh, are two transporters located in the proximal tubule of the nephron that are responsible for nearly 100% of reabsorption of filtered glucose um, in the kidney. And in normal physiology, no glucose is ultimately excreted into the urine. Um, so that sets up for a very interesting mole molecule from a pharmacological path uh, uh, standpoint. These are rapidly absorbed therapies. They have long clinical half-lives, and they have really no clinically relevant drug-drug interactions. And so that allows for once daily oral dosing in, uh, irrespective of background therapy. Furthermore, uh, these therapies, at least in terms of glucose lowering, are dependent on glomerular filtration. We know that chronic kidney disease commonly overlaps with our patients. And in fact, these lose their glucose lowering properties in advanced chronic kidney disease. So we don't need to worry about changes in their background antihypoglycemic therapies for most individuals. Furthermore, at low blood glucose levels, these drugs lose their efficacy in terms of glucose lowering, such that they have essentially no, if not limited risks of hypoglycemia. Despite their loss of efficacy as glucose lowering therapies with at low glomerular filtration in chronic kidney disease or at low blood glucose levels, um, including with normal glycemia, these drugs are highly effective as we'll learn in heart failure 
and in delaying progression of chronic kidney disease. So again, here in blue is uh, um, the normal um, curve here between relationship between plasma glucose on the x-axis and then what is excreted. And in most cases, until you reach about a plasma glucose of about 180, you're not going to see any urine that's um, urinary glucose that's ultimately spilled. In contrast, the SGLT2 inhibitors shift this curve such that even at slightly elevated blood glucose levels, you see urinary glucose levels that are elevated and excreted. Um, but as you move down and as um, blood glucose levels kind of normalize, um, you see uh, they lose their efficacy in terms of glucosuria or uh, glycemic excretion. So you may be wondering, well, how do these drugs then actually work in terms of um, uh, uh, protection against cardiovascular disease as well as chronic kidney disease? Those pathways are still being worked out. Um, what's very clear is even early upon initiation, these drugs do uh, affect um, uh, positive remodeling and improvement in uh, left ventricular not only function, left ventricular mass, and uh, positive LV remodeling. And this been, has been shown in um, these elegant uh, cardiac MRI studies. Um, and so this is uh, kind of the current landscape of the SGLT2 inhibitors. There's been 11 late phase clinical trials that have been conducted. Um, while we started in type 2 diabetes, which encompasses about 34 million Americans, um, we've now expanded these indications to heart failure, um, uh, uh, encompassing about 6 million Americans, and chronic kidney disease encompassing about 40 million Americans. And um, the individual indications will review slightly vary by therapy, but in general, we've seen class effects of their efficacy spectrum. So uh, I'll briefly review the clinical trial evidence. They were first studied in type two diabetes at high cardiovascular risk. These are mostly individuals with either established atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease or people with multiple risk factors for cardiovascular disease. You can see that they had modest improvement in major adverse cardiovascular events. This was really driven mostly actually by reductions in cardiovascular death. Um, one trial did identify a significant reduction in cardiovascular and all-cause mortality, but you can see the majority of the signal and the unexpected signal was protection against heart failure, as well as protection against kidney disease. And we'll see this incipient kid kidney disease uh, as we'll see in a moment. And you can see that the risk reductions here are substantial, 30 to 35% on average, um, and consistent across the individual therapy that was tested. Um, and so this led to expansion of the FDA labeling, not just for glucose lowering, but in additionally for cardiovascular protection. This is fairly unique to this drug class that multiple labels um, uh, for an individual therapy, including for protection against, uh, for use in diabetes, but also protection against cardiovascular and kidney diseases. So I had mentioned that the other substantial and surprising signal was that there was protection against kidney, uh, uh, kidney disease protect, uh, progression. And you can see here, this is really massive protection on the order of 40 to 50% risk reductions in incipient kidney disease, including progression to requiring uh, dialysis or renal replacement therapy. And this was again, fairly consistent across the individual drugs within the class. Um, and this is the KDGO heat map. And this is just one way to ca characterize risk of progression of kidney disease. On the x-axis is albuminuria. We progress from normal or no albuminuric excretion to micro to macro albuminuria. And then on the y-axis is progression of uh, progressive declines in EGFR. There have been really um, uh, three large-scale randomized clinical trials that have been uh, studied this. And this is just the spectrum of the types of patients that were enrolled in those trials. They're generally patients who have modest reductions in EGFR, but substantial albuminuria. And I would argue that many of the patients that we see commonly actually fit in this, um, uh, in this uh, type of studied landscape. And both of these clinical trials showed consistent reductions, even in people who have established chronic kidney disease in progression to needing dialysis. Importantly, one of these clinical trials called DAFA-CKD 
study the population even without di diabetes and firmly establish that these drugs, in fact, do not um, uh, only work in diabetic states, but in fact, also help in organ protection, even in those without diabetes. So I'll move to an area that perhaps cardiologists were most interested in, and that was heart failure. And I mentioned that SGLT2 inhibitors powerfully prevented heart failure in those with diabetes. But what about the treatment of heart failure, even in those without diabetes? And in fact, that was studied now in two to three large-scale randomized trials and showed not only a reduction in cardiovascular death or heart failure events, but also a reduction in all-cause mortality, improvement in overall survival. And for the first time of any heart failure with reduced ejection fraction therapy, this class of therapies delayed kidney progression, delayed a hard clinical endpoint of needing dialysis in people with heart failure. Um, and remarkably, the risk protection, about 25% on the primary endpoints, was seen irrespective of diabetes status. So you can see in this large group of people, about 60 to 70, 60% um, uh, of individuals with, without diabetes in the trial, you can see that they still uh, uh, obtained almost identical protection with this class of therapies. Um, I'll just mention this because this is relatively hot off the presses that Emperor Preserved was at the first randomized trial to study people even at higher ejection fractions, anywhere above 40%, and in fact, consistently demonstrated that these drugs appear to be beneficial across the ejection fraction spectrum. So irrespective of diabetes status, irrespective of ejection fraction, these drugs seem to protect against clinical events and heart failure hospitalizations in people with heart failure. So this is the most recent FDA labeling expansion. So now drugs are not only uh, um, recommended for type two diabetes, including for glycemic control and cardiovascular risk reduction in those patients, but now uh, are FDA approved for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and chronic kidney disease with and without diabetes. And this will continue to evolve over time as new trials are reported as well as evaluated by the FDA. But this is the present uh, snapshot of that approval process. So what are some of the more practical implementation uh, assessments? So I'd mentioned that these are once daily therapies. Um, and the most commonly used and the vast majority of patients are on two of those drugs. That's dapagliflozin and empagliflozin. Dapagliflozin is Farsiga and empagliflozin is Giardians. The nice thing is for our cardiovascular patients and even for our diabetic patients, the dosing is very simple. Both drugs are dosed 10 milligrams once daily. There's no need for titration um, and um, uh, all patients can be initiated on the target dose of 10 milligrams. So what are some of the safety issues that we need to be uh, considerate about? Um, the most common safety event is genital mycotic infections or yeast infections. Um, and this is predominantly in individuals uh, in women with prior histories of yeast infections. Um, and you can see here the risk, uh, uh, risk estimates are highest in that uh, 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 patient population. Uh, but men, especially uncircumcised men, are also at risk. Thankfully, these risks are um, not only infrequent, but also um, relatively mild, that they can be treated either with um, uh, uh, a single dose of an oral therapy like fluconazole or over-the-counter topical antifungal therapies. Um, the second aspect is related to glycemic effects. And this often comes up in clinical practice. These drugs, of course, were developed for uh, type two diabetes. Should we, you know, should we as cardiologists actually be using these drugs? Um, but in fact, as you can see in our higher risk patients uh, with chronic kidney disease or heart failure, as I'll show next, these drugs basically lose their glycemic effects. And so they basically have uh, across all clinical trials of CKD and heart failure, they virtually have no between arm differences in A1C. When used in patients with diabetes, they do have modest glucose lowering. Um, in general, these therapies don't require substantial changes in background therapies. Um, if patients are on higher doses of insulin or on complex regimens of diabetes, it's, uh, it's recommended that 
coordination of care alongside an endocrinologist is recommended. However, on pa in patients who have um, otherwise modest control, don't have significant histories of, for instance, hypoglycemia or DKA, cardiologists should feel very comfortable in initiating, even in, an, uh, in a patient with diabetes. These are the data here of um, the glycemic effects in heart failure. Uh, this is one of the randomized clinical trials, for instance, um, DAPA-HF. And you can see here on the left-hand panel is the 45% of patients with diabetes. You can see virtually no uh, between arm differences, just subtle uh, uh, reduction in A1C. And those without diabetes, there is no effect on glycemia. There is no hypoglycemia. And so in those 55% of patients who we see with heart failure without diabetes, I do not counsel about glucose. I don't ask them to uh, obtain gl uh, uh, glucometers. There's no need to monitor uh, A1Cs in these patients. Um, And this is to reinforce that the safety profile in our high-risk cardiovascular patients is Im very impressive in the context of clinical trials. And imp importantly, these are the glycemic adverse events. You can see here that on average, adverse events were actually more frequent with placebo than with these therapies. And in fact, glycemic adverse events were no different compared with placebo. Um, we sometimes hear about diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, you'll remember um, that uh, this is an infrequent event in patients with type 2 diabetes related to uh, elevated ketoacidosis or ketoacidosis, um, especially in the presence of elevated glucose levels. Um, in, with treatment of an SGLT2 inhibitor, this is a unique side effect of uh, euglycemic DKA in which DKA can occur even with normal glucose levels. And how does this occur? Well, glucose is excreted in the, um, in, by the kidneys, and thus that signals the liver to, uh, uh, via beta oxidation to metabolize free fatty acids and thus increase ketone bodies, and so through lipolysis. And so this increases the amount of circulating ketone bodies, and in states in which um, uh, um, uh, acidosis is promoted, for instance, in fasting states or excess alcohol states, then ketoacidosis can actually occur even with normal glucose levels. So how can we actually avoid this? Um, with our elective procedures or surgeries, including PCI, the recommendation is to hold these therapies three days prior to the uh, elective procedure. Um, in addition, counseling against um, uh, aspects that promote elevated ketones like excess alcohol or ketogenic diets. Um, in addition, if there's any period in which there's prolonged NPO status, um, that is a recommended uh, to hold, uh, hold the therapy. For instance, if it was a complicated PCI, they're having a complex, uh, for instance, CCO, CCU stay, it's reasonable to hold the therapy during hospitalization. Um, importantly, this is only an adverse event that's seen in patients with diabetes. If you're using it for CKD or heart failure, it's not a consideration that's uh, important. Amputations was an early concern with this therapy. It's no longer a concern. Um, this was a potential signal identified in one of now 11 randomized clinical trials called the CANVAS trial that identified about a twofold increase in lower limb amputations, specifically toe amputations. Um, however, this was not seen in any, with any other therapy, um, uh, including in a follow-up clinical trial of the same therapy, canagliflozin, um, in a high-risk population of chronic kidney disease. So based on the totality of evidence in August of last year, the FDA actually removed that safety warning or black box warning against canagliflozin. Um, and so still we do recommend not initiating it in a patient with active peripheral artery disease, for instance, who have been admitted for a peripheral intervention or who, had, um, who uh, have an active foot lesion that's still healing or if they're still on IV antibiotics. But once they're out of that acute phase, these patients are at high risk and we know that they still benefit from these therapies. <clears throat> 
Um, blood pressure is really remarkable with these therapies in that it has almost this titratable effect in that at low blood pressures, which is commonly an issue in our heart failure with reduced EF patients, these drugs really have no blood pressure lowering or very minimal blood pressure lowering. And when blood pressure is quite elevated, let's say above target uh, in our cardiovascular patients, they have a modest blood pressure lower. So they do kind of what we hope they would do uh, in clinical practice. And, and so they can benefit patients across the spectrum of blood pressure. Uh, diuretics commonly uh, is an issue that comes up in clinical practice. These drugs seemingly should increase diuresis. However, in the randomized clinical trials, um, uh, there really hasn't been substantial changes in use of diuretics um, between placebo or the SGLT2 inhibitor arms. So no, uh, no longer do we recommend any upfront uh, anticipatory changes in diuretics. Um, this is something you can monitor and follow up and make changes in diuretics as needed um, uh, uh, based on their clinical status. Um, the SGLT2 inhibitors do uh, substantially benefit patients with respect to chronic kidney disease, and I would, uh, I would suggest that their benefits are very comparable to how, for instance, ACE inhibitors or ARBs protect against chronic kidney disease progression. So you'll remember that renin angiotensin system inhibitors cause dilation of the efferent arteriole, and that's how they lower interglomerular pressures, thus offset that, um, uh, that pressure overload in, in, uh, in the nephron and thus delay CKD progression. Similarly, the SGLT2 inhibitors cause constriction of the afferent arteriole, and through a similar mechanism, thus decrease glomerular pressures and long-term actually protect against CKD progression. So pictorially here in blue is our usual patient um, that has a predictable decline in the y-axis of EGFR. And as time goes on, they progress ultimately to um, end-stage kidney disease. Some patients do uh, require renal replacement therapy. In contrast in red with initiation of an SGLT2 inhibitor at the dotted line, there's an acute fall in EGFR because of that reduction in glomerular pressures. But long-term, you can see recovery and plateauing and protection and change in that long-term slope and long-term trajectory. And one of the questions, and I'll answer it more thoroughly, one of the questions is how do these drugs actually work? Um, I think that it cannot be ignored that SGLT2 uh, almost 95% or above of the transporters are located in the proximal tubule of the kidney. So in my opinion, they must work through kidney protection. And, um, and that uh, is the case in type 2 diabetes, certainly is the case in chronic kidney disease, and I suspect is likely the case in heart failure as well. Um, and this is the predominant mechanism that has been worked out that is very similar to how, for instance, renin angiotensin system inhibitors protect against CKD progression. So how do we then think about the, uh, these drugs and the kidneys? Unlike many of the therapies we use, including, for instance, MR antagonists or ACE inhibitors, these drugs actually have no direct kidney toxicity. Um, they do not cause kidney injury, don't cause any ATN, for instance. Um, and so the only reason they actually have kidney-specific EGFR thresholds uh, based on F is that they lose their glucose lowering potential at very low. We now know that these drugs are now indicated for heart failure and chronic kidney disease. So the FDA is revising these labels such that they're now indicated to quite low EGFRs. Even EGFRs almost approaching dialysis down to an EGFR of 20, these drugs can be used. So the composite evidence is that they're certainly safe down to an EGFR of 20. They have low glycemic effects in this range, and they don't cause any intrinsic kidney injury. We expect that these drugs will cause an initial dip in EGFR, but then there's recovery. There's no clinical action similar to how we start an ACE inhibitor. There's no clinical action that's required with that EGFR dip. I would not prematurely discontinue therapy. Um, this is an expected decline that's related to the pharmacology of the drugs. 
Um, they're not studied in dialysis and they should be discontinued in people who start dialysis. However, interestingly, even if they progress in terms of kidney, uh, kidney disease, they can be continued um, uh, down uh, up until the point that they start dialysis. All right, um, one question that does come up is, should these patients be started on metformin first, then staged onto an SGLT2 inhibitor? Well, um, uh, initially we weren't sure, but certainly now we have 11 randomized clinical trials and there's virtually no uh, variability based on baseline metformin use. Um, and now uh, clinical practice guidelines have also evolved such that, for instance, here's our ESC uh, clinical practice guidelines that SGLT2 inhibitors or GLP-1 receptor agonists should be started based on risk, irrespective of if they were or were not treated with metformin. So start the drug if they are at um, uh, high enough risk. If they have concomitant ASCVD and type 2 diabetes, they qualify and should be on, uh, on therapy. Um, just a quick word before we conclude on cost, because this is often comes up. These are out-of-pocket costs um, uh, that uh, e even without insurance, and this is, uh, as you can see, quite pricey, about $500 a month. Um, uh, and this is juxtaposed compared with other diabetic therapies, including GLP-1 receptor agonists, which are anywhere from 600 upwards. Um, but importantly, drugs that don't have any cardiovascular kidney benefit, like DPP-4 inhibitors that are used on, on the order of at least twice as commonly in clinical practice are equivalent pricing. So if you see a patient on a DPP-4 inhibitor and a Lipton, in your mind, you should say, we should make an equivalent switch in terms of pricing, but for a much more highly effective therapy. Um, and in fact, uh, just a quick word that pricing alone should not deter us because these drugs were introduced in 2013. The first generics will be available as of, 2004, uh, as of 2024, so just around the corner. So our familiarity and comfort with these therapies should become uh, 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 greater and broader um, as we approach generic status. Um, so just very briefly, a, a look ahead. We have starting at the AHA of Impulse, that is a trial of um, acute heart failure with empagliflozin, it's a modest sized trial, about 500, that we will see. Um, there's a large scale trial of uh, DELIVER, um, that is a 6,000 patient trial of depagliflozin in, in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction with or without diabetes. There is another acute heart failure trial with depagliflozin called DAPA ACT um, TIMI 68. That's a 2,400 patient trial that will report out uh, in about a year. And then I'll just spend uh, a brief moment. There are trials underway in myocardial infarction, even in those without diabetes. So this is called impact mi This is of uh, type 1 MI, about 3,000 patients who are being randomized um, to empagliflozin or placebo and being followed for a heart failure event or mortality. Um, and a high-risk status for heart failure is required. So what does that mean? Um, at the time of MI. And so that includes um, signs and symptoms of congestion requiring treatment or newly uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction less than 45%. Um, so these are high risk um, uh, type 1 MI patients being randomized to an SGLT2 inhibitor that likely will directly inform their care. In addition, there's a large scale uh, Swedish registry trial called DAPA MI, that's 6,000 patients. Um, these are patients with MI without type 2 diabetes, so this will greatly expand who we treat um, with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And again, um, this is a long-term trial that we'll soon hear about. Uh, just of interest, this is a small trial, but um, of about 1,000 patients um, of individuals undergoing TAVI um, uh, uh, and from our Spanish colleagues, and these are uh, uh, again, depagliflozin versus uh, um, uh, standard of care and being followed for mortality after TAVR. Um, and so we'll learn more if they have other potential benefits as well. All right. Um, so 
I'll just conclude there and then we'll open the floor for any questions. Here's the spectrum of efficacy. These are drugs that clearly prevent heart failure in people with type 2 diabetes. They slow progression of kidney disease in those with CKD with or without diabetes, and that's on maximally tolerated renin angiotensin system inhibitors. There are an additional pillar of care for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, including mortality benefit. They reduce hospitalization and improve quality of life in HEFPEF. And ongoing trials in HEFPEF, acute heart failure, albuminic chronic kidney disease, as well as post-MI and post-TAVI. Uh, um, uh, so I think we'll learn a substantial more in the next uh, one to two years. Generics are on the horizon. These are once daily oral therapies at fixed dosing. Just remember 10 milligrams of empagliflozin, 10 milligrams of depagliflozin, the most common therapies on the market. Um, and uh, um, they are really benefit from ease of use and a wealth of safety data across 11 randomized clinical trials. So thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to uh, discussion. I know there's many questions in the chat room and I'm happy to answer them. So Mutu, I wanna thank you so much for that thorough and a very practical talk. You know, I, I find that, you know, we had an initial hesitancy about starting these drugs because we thought of these as endocrine drugs. And now the data are more and more clear that these are cardiac drugs and we should be thinking about it. So I have a few questions, but I wanna respect my colleagues who were there first. So the first question came from Adi Dahar, which you touched on briefly, the mechanism of benefit of SCLT2 inhibitors on improving all-cause death and heart failure. So do you wanna expand on that a little bit? Absolutely. The, the short answer is um, we don't um, immediately know. There's early benefits and early separation of curves across the 11 trials. So many have wondered whether there is this early, um, whether the early hemodynamic and acute decongestive effect is predominant um, and, and um, may, may lead to improved outcomes. But of course, we know that that's not the case for simple diuretics or other therapies um, that decongest patients. So uh, there's certainly more to the story. Um, I touched on the CKD benefit um, and improvement and um, early improvement in uh, um, kidney progression is a uh, important determinant, of course, in cardiovascular health as well, um, and that may be at play. There's early remodeling benefit, and so many have wondered about a more of a metabolic benefit with this class of therapies. There's an early switch in fuel uh, utilization from predominantly glucose or uh, uh, um, free fatty acids towards ketone bodies. And ketone bodies we know are metabolically more efficient for the heart and maybe um, allows for early uh, uh, improvements in efficient, efficiency and myocardial performance. Those are some of the positive benefits. Um, I think there's still more that's being worked out. There's certainly more mechanistic trials underway. Thank you. So there's a very practical question again from Adi Dar, which is if you get genital infection, do you stop the drug or in patients who have recurrent infections, do you stop SGLT2 inhibitors? How do you manage genital infections in these patients? Yeah, from my own experience, this has been the most challenging issue with this class of therapies. It's not, it's not every patient, and it's, it's, it's still a minority of patients, and it's only patients with diabetes. And I hope I, that spectrum of efficacy um, uh, uh, map, I hope that in five years, um, diabetics should, should actually be the minority of patients we treat because the majority should still be patients um, with chronic kidney disease, with heart failure, who um, even in those without diabetes. Um, and so uh, this is only an issue in patients with diabetes. Um, after the first episode of general mycotic infection, wait for it, uh, it to clear and then resumption, generally holding the therapy during the actual active infection is recommended. Um, with recurrent infections, often I will ask them to meet with their PCP or the, um, their uh, gynecologist for a preventative therapy if they are open to that. And um, often this is circumstantial that they develop these yeast infections. And so sometimes preventative therapy is uh, something that is um, a, a possibility. 
Um, at the end of the day, in those with recurrent infections, especially from my own experience, men with recurrent infections with balanitis, um, they are reluctant to go on with therapy. And that is just uh, part of, um, uh, but that is a minority of patients um, that I've seen. And, you know, a practical question for this audience, what's the best time to initiate this therapy in someone who's undergoing PCI? Should we wait till we see them in clinic or should we be starting them uh, right after the procedure? I think Dr. Sukul touched on this with his question. Should we delay starting medications after PCI with significant contrast use where you're more concerned about risk for C, uh, CIN? Um, so uh, it is a great question. So related to the contrast question, we, I, I don't want to overstep what the current data suggests. So we currently have two large MI trials underway, I think, uh, and many of those patients are, um, are early after PCI. And so I would su suggest that in those patients who, who receive a large contrast load, that waiting is probably more appropriate. All clinical trials, those 11 that I had mentioned, um, did exclude patients early after acute MI. And that's why um, in the, typically in the month to three months, and that's why um, those additional clinical trials are underway. Um, that said, in those with low contrast exposure or otherwise stable, um, uh, we have made it a routine pathway to actually initiate these therapies pre-discharge and have not seen significant safety issues. Um, they have an expected decline in EGFR, and so there needs to be some um, uh, important communication also with all um, uh, kind of post-discharge clinicians that are going to follow these patients that that EGFR decline should not be a reason to um, discontinue therapy, um, but it may be confounded, for instance, with CIN. And so um, it is something that is um, a little bit trickier to navigate. Um, uh, in general, though, um, certainly in those individuals who are undergoing uh, PCI with a little bit longer length of stays or individuals who are post bypass surgery, um, we've been initiating them routinely. Thank you. Uh, you know, another question is, is this a class effect? A very, very important question. So three major indications, type 2 diabetes for glycemic control and cardiovascular risk reduction, chronic kidney disease and reduction in CKD progression, and heart failure. Um, the most patients that are being used in clinical practice right now are type 2 diabetes. And for that, it is a class effect. Um, there are four FDA-approved therapies. I try to get patients on whatever therapy that is cheapest for them, um, and all seem to be quite effective in protecting against uh, cardiovascular and kidney events. For heart failure and CKD, only a couple have actually been studied and we have data um, for. And so um, while I think that it is a class effect as well, I think the more practical aspect is FDA labeling and payer coverage is going to be for the therapies that have been studied. So for heart failure, that is DAPA and EMPA or Giardians and, um, or, or and Farsica and Giardians. Um, and for CKD, at least at the present time, um, Invokana or Canagliflozin and Depagliflozin or Farsica are the two that have been studied. We have an ongoing trial uh, called um, EMPA kidney studying, um, studying Empagliflozin. So um, I think we will... Um, uh, this will slowly evolve as well for, for instance, CKD, I bet we're going to be in a, um, a, in a uh, class effect zone, uh, but definitely for type 2 diabetes, I recommend this is a class effect. Okay. Uh, so we have a couple more questions uh, and one more minute. So I want to uh, make sure we can move to our next topic. So you can see this is a very uh, important topic. And there's a lot of interest. So one question is related to your pathway. So I might ask if you can share the pathway with us so we can share with the broader team. That might be of more practical value. And then the question from a comment from Dr. Koresh here leads to, you know, I, I'm bad with trade names. Yes. The absolute mortality reduction in heart failure with reduced EF. Um, so I, I think that, that that's a reasonable comment. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, it's a great question. So the um, so a reminder that um, you know eleven randomized clinical trials, some variability in the designs of these trials, 
Um, for diabetes, only one trial actually showed an all-cause mortality benefit, and that was an, a trial of empagliflozin in a trial called Empereg Outcome. In chronic kidney disease, um, dapagliflozin or Farsiga showed a mortality benefit in DAPA CKD, and in heart failure with reduced rejection fraction, as was pointed out, DAPA HF uh, with dapagliflozin. In general, it might take your differences um, for the ones that have been studied um, within the indicated uh, indicated populations. Um, so I, I really appreciate all your time, and um, I certainly will follow up um, with uh, Dave Raj and Hitbinder with a pathway um, to be able to uh, share more. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So again, I want to just say a huge thank you on behalf of BMC2 and all our participating sites. This was a immensely helpful talk, and I think it'll have a huge impact on our practice and uh, eventually on our patient outcome. So thank you so much, Mutu. We are so appreciative of your talk. Thank you. Thank you all.